So, Chris, thank you for being here. I really, really appreciate you taking uh, the time to chat with us, chat with fellow founders. I, I know that your insight is going to be invaluable. Your advice is going to be invaluable to um, our fellow founders who may be thinking about selling a business, but also going and working for the acquirer and potentially being part of a second sale and, in your case, a third. So um, I, I think we're going to hear some amazing things. But I first I want to tell you, when you agreed to take this time slot today, I had no problem bumping Mark Cuban from this spot. So thank you again for being here. <laughs> we'll have to reach out and thank him. <laughs> so uh, I, I typically like to start uh, with how we met, right? And sure. what's, what's interesting is I'm relatively new to Detroit. I moved in, I think, 2013, built a business, sold a business here, and got thrust into that entrepreneurial ecosystem. And I would say throughout the years, probably in the last two years, maybe more, your name has come up multiple times based on, you know, if you're building companies, if you're part of the growth of companies, selling companies, you need to meet Chris Messo. And I think maybe we traded an email here, there, and then we were at kind of similar gatherings where people are like, you two have to meet. And I was always like, yeah, I'm always open to meeting other entrepreneurs. But when we finally did get to meet and kind of understand not just backgrounds and what we've done, but how we think about entrepreneurship and how we think about our responsibility to give back and help people uh, get better, maybe make fewer mistakes, the mistakes that we've made, anything that we can give back to that community, I know is incredibly fulfilling to you. In fact, you've launched a comp another company to do just that. And yeah. it is for me as well. It's a big part of, uh, of this podcast. So, um, you know, we haven't known each other long, but I think, you know, there are lots of ways for us to work together, collaborate and become friends. So this is a, a great first step. I appreciate you, uh, you doing this. Thank you. Yeah, back at you. I agree with all of what you just said. So I, you know, I look forward to this conversation. So, uh, you know, typically we jump to the exit, right? But in your case, it's it's a fascinating start and then a long history. And I thought maybe you take us through it, um, how you thought of this idea, how you developed it, and then, you know, when it started getting interesting that you should be thinking about a liquidity event or, you know, a sale of the business. Sure. So if we're talking about uh, uh, the the business being uh, named Mobile Air, so mm -hmm. I started that in my 20s and really out of the back of a garage, almost literally. And over the years, um, probably within five years into it, um, I, I really understood. So we did portable equipment, so portable heating, portable cooling, commercial, industrial. Mm -hmm. So by example, when they built Little Caesars Arena, which is, you know, that's a, that's a building that's, you know, a lot of people will go to. Mm -hmm. So we designed and built equipment to uh, heat or acclimate that building during construction. Yep. So colleges, universities, hospitals, multi big buildings, we would acclimate. So, but within five years into that company, so go back in time, you know, on my kitchen table, I was, I was figuring out, that um, we were not going to make it. Okay. So my costs were escalating. So products, uh, you know, equipment, um, re, you know, motors, I mean, just replacement stuff, new products. So CapEx, mm -hmm. um, wages, trucks, buildings. Um, my costs were increasing and my revenue uh, per product, what I was getting for my rental or lease was um, going down. So that because you, of co competition? Yeah. Was driving it down? Yep. Yeah. And we're, we all really had the same products, really. So, you know, no one really had a moat. And, um, and literally, that's what it came down to. How can we be different? And, and I quite literally just went back to, you know, some of the people that I really knew and trusted. And I was very open with them. And I just asked them, uh, hey, you know, we say we have the best service. Yeah, I don't know. We say we have the best products. Yeah, we all have the same products. Yeah. And so all these things that we've been saying, I'm just going to say, you know, uh, it comes down to the product. You know, service is huge, but it mm -hmm. really does come down to 
what is a differentiator? What is a moat that we can build? And it, and it was, you know, the product. And I just asked them, could it be a different color? I'm just trying to, you know, just get the conversation to start right. Yeah. Uh, how can it operate better? Um, you know, the, the performance, what are you looking for? What do you need? And I was amazed. I, you know, we're talking about, you know, I'm in 911 switchgear rooms. I'm in um, hospital build outs on existing hospitals. Yeah. I'm in some major, major, um, you know, opportunities. And I got permission to just prototype equipment. And I had some, it wasn't just me. I mean, I cannot say that's me at all. There are some really good, smart people that um, were you know, inside my company that I immediately engaged with and said, hey, this is an opportunity for us to, you know, build something that no one else has and give us an opportunity, you know, opportunity to increase, raise our our prices, so raise our revenue, and at the same time, if, if it worked out, I have I have an increased value to the client. And so fast forward years later, uh, we started uh, from a prototype shop to a small manufacturing shop, and uh, we just started building 10 of these or 50 of those or 100 of those. And Amazing. pretty so soon we, we had our moat. So, Chris, so you, you're seeing the business declining, right? The ec unit economics maybe aren't yeah. working, right? You're seeing right. that. And now you got to invest in this moat, which may or may not work. So there had to be a bunch of risk around that for you. What, um, what really, was it Was it just do or die? Is that the, how you made the decision to, to dive in like that? Yeah, it's amazing how people are wired. And, you know, maybe some people are miswired and I'll be part of that camp. <laughs> um, my, you know, my house was completely over leveraged and that's, you know, back in the early nineties, you can do all that crazy stuff. Yeah. Um, I had borrowed as much as I could possibly borrow and I was maxed out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I actually yeah, felt very comfortable. Story. Yeah. I felt very comfortable doing it back in that, back in those days. I yeah. really, I really believed in what we had was, um, was good. It was solid. Yeah. yeah, it's incredible that kind of commonality that uh, founders have to have, right? Almost that uh, irrational, positive outlook on what's going to happen in order to make it when, when a lot of other people would say, no, no, no I'm, not, I'm never taking that risk in my life. And you're also, you're, yeah. you're probably early 30s at that point, right? You started around 29. You're facing the realities the next couple of years, right? You're relatively young at that point i guess we're all young still hopefully yeah uh, well, but, but maybe yeah. less risk in, in <laughs> that we have in kind of later life uh yeah. or, or risk tolerance uh changes certainly as we get older all right so you uh you you turn the corner you you're building the moat right you've got the competitive advantage and and customers got to see you do this along the way and and so is it smooth sailing for the next it's, few years or it's never smooth <laughs> <laughs> it is it is never smooth sailing that was your and I don't, well it's you know probably some people do a better job than i do but there is there is always whatever we planned and we were very um uh diligent planners but whatever mm -hmm. we did plan on a one year five year ten year we had a lot of different segments of time going and what we wanted to do but there's always an obstacle and mm -hmm. um so you know the people who survive learn how to, you know, dig under the wall, go around the wall, go over the wall, you know, whatever you need to do, you just gotta, you gotta hunker down, you gotta think it through and you gotta have an action. I think, isn't that a personality question? You run into a wall, do you go around it, under it or over it? And yep. your answer some, you know, says something about you. Um, so, okay, so, you know, you, you figured out it's not smooth sailing, but you are building you know, uh, uh, you're building a real company that's growing and growing to the point where third parties are now taking notice and they're think they're seeing something that they may want to purchase, right? So you have multiple companies interested along the way. Yeah. So you know, you know this probably better than I do, um, and I really enjoy macroeconomics. Um, I was in Houston and they had a huge hurricane, and this is. You know, um, September, October of, is it 2008 maybe, where, you know, Lehman Brothers uh, fell? Yep. 
I yep. think it's eight, 2008? Yeah, yeah, uh, August, yep. Okay, so August, yeah, so I was down there for a couple months and I was experimenting, right? So I'm still doing that, I'm still experimenting and we're about to release a, a new product to the market, which was just awesome. And, but I actually was watching on, live on TV in, in this just run down hotel room, it was horrible. But it's, you know, thank God I even had a place to stay. And I was experimenting with buildings so no one in the right mind would give me a building, a, I mean like a Walmart size building or, or bigger, yeah. flood it and let me experiment with it. There's no way. Yeah. But in a hurricane, Katie bar the door. You know, all you have to yeah. do is knock on a few doors and they'll let you, you know, go in and try to help them. And we really crushed it. We did a great job of experimenting with our equipment to the point where our next series of equipment uh, came from those experiments. And we really did great. an awesome job for those owners. That's great. But in that time period, we're watching Lehman Brothers and you know a lot of the other conversations that went down, I had almost a, uh, I don't know, like a small panic attack of, look at the, you know, I was personally had seven figure capex every year. I mean, mm -hmm. without, a, without even blinking mm -hmm. and what was I doing? Because I did not understand the greater macro environment. And I knew that by watching the television. I knew I didn't know. And that shocked me. Mm -hmm. and, and the more I looked and read and asked questions and got a hold of people. So fast forward, 2015, you know, so several years later, I'm on my kitchen table. And, and I'm looking at what I think is a crude evaluation. And, and I thought, well, if this is right, which I, I, there's no way it can be right. Um, my company is worth twice, I think, of what it would have been worth maybe five to seven years prior. Wow. And I'm thinking, well, I just, I just can't be correct. So I went and searched, uh, and I did a lot of business with Merrill Lynch during those days. And I finally got to the guy I needed to get to. And I sat down, as soon as I figured out who he was, I almost tackled him. Mm -hmm. And we spent a lot of time together. And when it was done, I was not, you know, exactly spot on. I was close, close enough yeah. that that still gave me great pause. I went and talked to my um, partner and I just said, hey, listen, here's how I'm thinking about it. We can, you know, we're still in our 50s. We can graduate from high school all over again yeah. and do anything we want in life. And I mean like anything because we're done. Um, do you want to do that or do you want to keep working? Yep. And we both made the choice to graduate from high school all over again. Chris, that's awesome. There's a, there's a lot there, right? So Yeah. Your, your first, your, your sense of valuation, um, were you, you were doing that yourself? You had a, a, a decent idea of how to value it and then verified it with an uh, investment banker at Merrill Lynch? Uh, I, I, I'm going to say they, uh, if they would chuckle to yeah. know how I got to, uh, how I got to the, you know, to the end result, but I was yeah. close enough that I could have a conversation yeah. that to me and with them made sense. Well, you started with that you don't love macroeconomics and assumed that maybe I did, and, and that is certainly not true. Uh, but I can certainly appreciate macroeconomic factors affecting businesses yep. and companies that go to sell, right? And a yep. new external um, event like COVID, right, can change the world, change the game, right? So being aware that that can happen, I guess, is, is good to have, uh, good to have that awareness. But yeah, I'm, I'm certainly no uh, expert there. But then you followed up with hitting valuation pretty close to on the nose. Um, that that's impressive. So that valuation, and then uh, subsequent validating that valuation was, hey, this this may be our moment, right? Uh, what you would yeah. have to do to get to the next level or the next hurdle of valuation, maybe did you did you evaluate that with your partner as well? In terms of, you know, what we had to go through, we had no idea uh, of what we are really going to go through. Um, when we wa walk through those doors, 
yep. it was so new to us. I mean, selling a business is okay. so com- – you already know this, right, Todd? But yeah. selling a business is so completely dynamically different than yeah. running a business. For sure. And, and there were there were discoveries um, by the day. And not only are they just fundamentally different, you have to do them at the same time. Yeah. Run a business and sell a business, right? Very difficult to do. But you yep. put together a, a great team, obviously, to get this yep. done for you. Yep. And, and and then you take it to market, right? Or they, yeah. they do that for you. Yeah. So the, so some of the, some of the uh, folks I know today, you know, so, you know, today I'm a strategic business coach and I work with uh, business owners, privately held business owners. We had these conversations quite a bit, Todd. And whereas it's, it's amazing. Um, if you think that you're going to travel down this particular road that you've never been down before, you don't know what the speed limits are. You don't know where the gas stations are. You don't know where the restrooms are, the hotels, right? There's you have you don't even have headlights, and you're going to be driving at night half the time. It you know not to not go through this with a professional is hubris. I love that. I mean, what great analogies there. Yeah. We're always using sports analogies, but boy, you hit it on the nose. And I yeah. always follow up with and you have to keep your business growing right (laughs) the worst thing you can do in that situation of selling a business is let your business slide um and so yeah you you know t-rex advisory is what you're doing right to help founders kind of graduate to that moment of when they consider can consider exiting right so you're 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 putting them through the paces testing that model uh, testing every part of that business, improving every part of that business, so they're truly maximizing their outcome when they decide to do this. Is that what T Rex is doing? It is. So yes, yes, it's really strategic business coaching, and if if it's done properly, right, and the you know through the eyes of the owner, right, you mm-hmm. got to use their lens. And if you could help drive a better uh, future enterprise value, if you can help these people. Uh, through this process of tools and concepts of living like a, a better personal life inside that company, which many have not for years, yep. um, you've got a winner. Yeah, I think that was one of the things I took from one of your talks in, in your office, um, and maybe even you you uh, elaborated on it, that the person that you are today is very different than the person you were when you were running that business and now. No comparison. The rest of life, right? The rest yeah. of life is and family are, are available, uh, yeah. much more available to you now. Okay, so that just kind of back to the exit. You go in. You've got the team. Um, they're going to assist you, but you're you're running two jobs here. You know what? What did you learn along the way? And and you know what 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 surprised you? What buyers came to the table? Anything that you can give us? On the first exit? Yeah, because I want to talk about the first one, and then what's okay. exciting is your next role, and then you do it again. Sure. And again. So, you know, you can imagine, and I'm sure a lot of owners who might even be listening to this in the future, um, they might be getting calls from uh, certain investment bankers, or they might be getting calls from their competitors, or they're getting calls from other people in the industry that they know. Um <clears throat> What uh, intrigued me is when we got to our investment banker, um, uh, I was uh, intrigued by the fact that we could get some of these players to the table together in a competitive bid, uh, what I would have not have been able to do while on my own at all. Yep. And during that process, um, the thing that was most intriguing to me is that we – potentially, there's no guarantee, but we potentially really had a good shot at um, adding on, so bolting on a larger manufacturer than we were. We played in manufacturing. The folks mm-hmm. that were going to be bolted on were true manufacturers. Okay. So they could, they could do a lot of things in engineering and build that we couldn't do. 
and then to top that off and to feed that um, entity, um, we could buy our largest competitor, which was so sweet. You can imagine <laughs> if you've competed, I mean, you yep. are a competitor. I know you are yep. um, from your history. And to uh, compete with somebody for 20 some years, decades, yep. head to head. And what you want to do is crush that entity that you're mm-hmm. competing with. Um, you know, it's, you know, you're taking, to me, it was, I'm eating steak or I'm eating mac and cheese. You know, what am I having today? Yeah. You know, so what are my efforts? You know, what am I rewarded for? And I, I'd rather have the uh, protein. I'd rather have the steak. <laughs> so it was so sweet to shake hands with my competitor and say goodbye. And so we bolted those three entities together, you know, to include yep. my company, yep. uh, new leadership team. And um, we stayed for, it took about two years to um, get all this to, you know, get to start to gel together. It's not mm-hmm. something that, you know, you're taking, you're taking uh, some key players that used to be your competitor also, right? Okay. And, okay. You're, and you're asking everybody, um, to play better in the sandbox together, right? Can I, can I, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, uh, so I just kind of want to summarize so I get it right. So you were approached, uh, well, you go to run a process because you understand that where your valuation is and the time of your life, this is something that you want to do. And the investment bank takes you to market and you're in identifying private equity firms that view you as a platform to potentially roll up a market, right? Bolt on others who are, are your competitors. So was that, yeah. was that, that was the strategy and, and yeah. was it all in one transaction or did you get purchased as the platform first and then initiate the purchases of your competitors? So there was already an established manufacturer in the background that we got bolted okay. on to and we okay. bolted on okay. our competitor. Got it. Um, so, but that, I mean, that alone, when that was explained to me in terms of the concept, because yeah. again, you know, I'm running a company. I'm not really interested in buying other companies and bolting on and going for you know a, a larger EBITDA draw for you know by other players. Yeah. So that wasn't part of my strategy of running a business. So this was so fascinating to me, and um, and timing wise, it worked for me uh, physically. Mm-hmm. So um, and that really trumped. Um, all the other players in the room. So all the other players who wanted to participate and and uh, seeing if they could uh, obtain the company, I just it didn't make didn't make any sense for me to continue those conversations at the end. This yep. this had too much going for it. That's great. So um, kind of step back. You made a comment about kind of bringing multiple potential buyers to the table at the same time, something that you wouldn't have been able to do yourself. And so the team is able to do that. They're able to balance that. And I think a lot of people think, oh yeah, I've got approached by one group. I will do my best to maximize my my, uh, purchase price or my sale price with one buyer. Uh, It's just really difficult to do unless you can force competition, right? Not only can you force price, but you can force timeline and professionals really know how to do that, right? So you've got that playbook down, you understand it. And then the most strategic offer comes to you where you get bolted on, but you know you're going to be part of growing and bolting on your competitors. Correct. I'm assuming, can you talk to me a little bit about the financial incentive for you to go be part of a platform? Because typically they don't buy 100% of you, right? They want you working to grow. And what was your role when you originally sold onto that platform? My role in the company? Yes, in the new company. Uh, so I stayed on as president for a very short period of time. Um, yep. My head was not going to stay in that game. The uh, what I did understand, um, and again, you know, you got to really. I'm, I'm going back uh, in, in my head right now as we're talking. Yeah, and I'm just going through the uh, the playbook of you know mentally, emotionally, physically. Yeah. All those things going on at my house, right? Yeah. Uh, talking to my wife, uh, yeah. talking to my partner, talking to you know these new partners, 
And knowing now and understanding more that, you know, you're, if you stay in specific spots inside this new entity mm-hmm. and we roll it fairly quickly, and two years to me is fairly quickly. Oh, yeah. Um, you're going to end up staying. Right? Okay. The, the odds are that you're going to end up uh, keeping a seat for even longer. And okay. um, I absolutely um, wanted to yeah, enjoy the graduation and not, okay. delay, and not delay it. Got it. But, you know, you, you sold once, but then you sold again. So Correct. how did this, how did the second time happen? Yeah. So on the second time, I didn't have a seat at the leadership table at the end. So there's no mm-hmm. reason for me uh, to be asked to stay. Uh, I'm going to call it the Kumbaya dinner. Yeah where you know you know that the funds are going to be transferred the next day you know, so everybody's going to get wired their money yeah um and we are at morton steakhouse and the the buyer which was equity one mm-hmm. said listen um you don't have um you know you're not going to participate and come come over physically um what wh- why don't you stay and i asked him i said well what would i do because um, I, you know, people who are in those positions currently, yeah, uh, we're good people, and you know, why would I displace anybody? Right. And I wanted out. Yeah. And he said to me, he goes, "Listen," he said, "You opened up nine offices in six states," and he said, "We're going to want to open up the West Coast, the East Coast, and and the uh, Florida, Georgia region." Mm-hmm. And uh, and I said, "Does that mean I'm I'm going to be a, a, on a plane like?" four or five days a week. (laughs) And he said, yeah. I said, well, you know, I just, you know, I just made my wife a promise that I'm not going to travel because I traveled, you know, all the, I was never home. I said, I just made her a promise. I'm not going to travel. And now you're offering me a chance to travel. I'm going to give you her number. You can call her. (laughs) He said, no. And I said, I'm not going to call her either. So, but he was, he was nice about it. He said, listen, he goes, would you want to carve out? And uh, and I knew what they're going to do, right? They're going to bolt on some other companies that we had talked about, and they're going to go mm-hmm. back out to market, which they did in yep. 2019. So um, I gave them a number what I'd be comfortable with. Uh, they mm-hmm. took they took that number, and um, it was it worked out very well. That's great. So we would call that the second bite of the apple, right, on Correct. their sales. So you had yep. equity in the overall platform. They're bolting it on. Presumably EBITDA revenue yep. going up, value of the company is going up. Yep. And that was, I think if I read it right, that was 2017. And then they sold again in 2019. Correct. Right. So you get that, that second check, right? Yep. That's, that's fantastic. I love hearing that, st- those stories. Yep. Now, did you, was there a third sale? Well, you know, there's my initial sale and yep. then, you know, then there are bolting on and then we sold again. Okay. So yep. that's the second transaction yep. and then yep. the final transaction. Yep. Um, it's it's fantastic, right? I have a couple of friends that have been through that and stuck it out with um, with the private equity firm, but we're working there, right? But I think you recognized you got to go to high school again, do whatever yeah. you graduate from high school again. <laughs> I don't ever want to go to high school again. No. But you get to graduate from high school again and uh, and do what you want. And at the same time, you know, you've got equity in something that's working for you that cashes out. In, in just two years, that's that's phenomenal. Um, yeah. Who has since, that opportunity? I mean, who literally in life has you know? Un, it, who does? Who yep. who who has the the wherewithal uh, and the opportunity in front of them that takes advantage of that? I mean, it's just very few. I I just feel fortunate. That's great. Yeah, you're right. It, it is rare air. We've had a few guests on that, and they all come to the same realization: like, wow, they're just sitting sitting on cloud nine that this that yeah. this was able to happen for them um so chris what what advice right i think along the way you've certainly picked out and p- you've pointed out some things to do um to create the right exit um certainly how difficult it's going to be um but you know what overall advice would you give to our fellow founders who would dream of being in your shoes and that might make it a little easier for them yeah, that's a really that's the that's a big question. That's a great question. The um, just know um, that you don't know what you don't know, and yeah. you and you're going to need to know some things that you don't know. 
Uh, and that's just a matter of fact. You know, selling a business, even preparing the business, is different than running the business. And the more time you give yourself to understand and to assess and to discover and to implement actionable items over a period of time will only benefit you. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think I've learned that over time. And, you know, one of the questions I asked you um, kind of off air was how long before an exit do you want to have some impact on these founders and their businesses, how they can prepare their business, prepare themselves, prepare their teams for that optimal outcome. And I think you were saying as, as, as far as five years before and maybe up to three years before, yes. two years at max. Yeah, so uh, we put together, um, and, and I appreciate you uh, mentioning this and even oh, yeah. uh, being with us, but we started a, another company f for this uh, mm -hmm. exact subject called uh, the Q5 experience. And for this to work really well, you'd have to have someone's attention uh, for about three years. Okay. It doesn't mean that in three years you go to market. You can yeah. say, hey, I want to do an ESOP or, hey, I want my two sons and my young niece to run this company. Uh, you know, however that works out. Uh, and mm -hmm. that could not, that could be in seven years. That could be in, in 18 years from now. But you just have uh, a plan that's better than most. Yeah, to get and, there. And, I, and what I think, what I appreciate about the service that you're doing now is you don't run that whole thing. You might quarterback, but you're bringing right. experts in each level of the business at the appropriate time to help these businesses grow and get a footing underneath them. Get prepared it is such an undertaking to to sell a business. And yep. buyers are going to be looking under those covers. And if you have not looked under those covers first and made everything the way it should be, right, you're, you're not going to have the same outcome. Yeah, they so, don't, uh, right. Yeah. Those buyers don't just check under the hood. Those <laughs> buyers have your car on a rotisserie and they're just turning that thing round and round. They're looking at every crevice that you've not paid attention to in 20 years. Yep. Yep. And you, and sometimes, you know, you, sometimes, Sometimes they'll view that as opportunity, and sometimes yep. it's negotiation to knock your price down. Correct. So, yeah, what you're doing for business owners is really invaluable. It's a step that people should not be um, overlooking if they're thinking about this business. Like you said, ESOP, going to family members or yep. you know, outright sale to a strategic or financial buyer. Yep. This is a must-have um, for really any serious business. Yeah. So, um, look, I really appreciate you coming and and sharing your story. Um, you said, you know, the competition. I love when you're, when you're talking about, you know, am I going to have steak or mac and cheese and no. how sweet it was to essentially eat the competition in a deal. I love that as, as part of the motivation, but just strategically understanding that this exit did a lot to build something yeah. that you started in six states and then w were able to grow across the country. That's got to be an unbelievable feeling. Yep. A legacy, right? In a, in a business that you created out of out of uh, a little garage, a storage area in your garage, or however it was, right? It's American dream. It really yep. is, and it's um, you know, it's just just how it played out. Thank God. And well, like, thank you. Yeah, like I tell our kids a lot. Uh, you know, we're all going to play on, on the, yep. whatever field you're going to play on. But if you have a sports analogy, which you like, yeah. um, I would rather look back in life and know that my uniform is dirty, that it's ripped, it's torn, uh, I've got some bruises. I, I know that I was on the field, and I know that I played as hard as I could play. I left nothing on the field. Hopefully, I'm smart enough to know that I got off the field when the game came to its logical conclusion, and I enjoyed like the fifth quarter of life. Chris, I love it. I got goosebumps. Yeah. That was awesome. Yeah. That was awesome. It's hard to do. <laughs> it's really hard to do. Really yeah. hard to do. But man, thank you. This is fantastic. I really appreciate you taking the time. I think people are going to get a lot out of this. Um, hopefully they're listening. There's a lot in there. I hope so. so. Uh, thank you. Thank you, my friend. Yeah. Thanks, Todd. Cool. All right. Stay on, Chris. Okay. This thing uploads. Let me stop recording.